All right, now we're on to one of the most fun panels we ever have at Health 2.0. We've been doing this for three years, uh, and I want to introduce you to a really, really great friend of mine, really great friend of Health 2.0. Uh, most of you know her, and if you don't, you should. This is Alexander Drain, who in her spare time is Chief Visionary Officer and Chairman of ELISA, but really is the queen of the unmentionables. Thank you. So I went over before this quickly to uh, the Blueprint Health Demo Day so I could soak in some of the energy of the entrepreneurs over there. And Brad Weinberg, one of their co-founders, came up to me and said, um, how are you doing? Are you excited? And I said, I'm not excited. I'm always nervous. I'm always nervous for this panel because I love it so much. I love this topic. I love everything about it. And he said, well, I have advice for you. You should just think about sex. And I said, Brad, I don't think that's a really good idea. And it reminds me of the... Um, sort of disconnect, I think, that has occurred about this panel. I got an email this morning from a friend who said, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the porn panel. <laughs> and yesterday, I ran into another friend who said, um, will you be showing pictures of people having sex? And then last night, a friend double dog dared me to mention the book Fear of Flying and then to explain to the audience why that book is so famous. So I did mention it. I will not explain to you why that book is so famous. There's Neil Sofian. If anyone wants a description, please go see Neil after. So I think part of this, we can uh, give credit back to Susanna Fox, whom I absolutely adore in many ways. She is a godmother of the unmentionables and the birth of it because she uh, moderated the first panel the first year. And that panel had all sorts of naughty words, and Susanna made everybody on the panel use the V word. So I think this is where sort of this mentality has come. But let me tell you in all seriousness what the unmentionables is all about. In a nutshell, it's the concept that maybe the biggest diseases in the United States are not asthma or diabetes or CHF, but rather instead the act of being a caregiver or having financial stress or having caregiver stress. And that perhaps, since these things take away our capacity and hurt our health and productivity, we need to be incorporating them into our definition of the responsibility that we have to the people that we serve. So this slide, I think, encapsulates a lot of it because it's the reason most of us get up in the morning is to impact these things to make a difference in the lives of the people that we're serving. But any of you who've been in the healthcare space for a long time know that we also could have shown this slide 20 years ago, and not only would it have at least been the same, it probably would have been better which you could say is an indictment of all the really hard work that we're all doing on a daily basis to impact this stuff. So we went back to Eliza, sat in a room and said, why is that and what would we have to do to turn those trends around? And we came up with a list. It's not the only list. It's not an exhaustive list. But it does give you a sense of the preventive lifestyle we'd all have to live to reverse those trends. And went around the room and of everybody in there, only two could raise their hand and said that they were living this lifestyle. Which, when you think about the fact that we are all over-informed, incredibly passionate about what we're doing, have plenty of resources at our disposal, and even we aren't living the lifestyles that we would have to to change the health of the country, it's hard to imagine how you would expect that somebody out in the wild who hasn't made these choices could. And by extension, you have to ask the question, why not? And we had this discussion that came around, and I'm going to run through really quickly the early findings from, that we shared in 2010, which comes down to the fact that all of us have a life and that life can get messy. We can be stressed out at work, debt, caring for an aging parent, and that these items, in fact, become unmentionable. It's something that we don't talk about as freely, even though there is evidence in the literature that they impact our health. So we wanted to see if we could get real people in the wild to talk about these and the things and the impact that they have. And what we found was that people are experiencing a lot of the unmentionables. When they experience them, they have an overwhelming impact on the quality of their life. The top unmentionables are caregiver, financial, relationship, job, stress, and, bad, and a bad sex life. And we also wanted to get a measure, which we call the ostrich index, for the delta between how much these things are defining our life and how supported we feel by the healthcare space in them. And the good news was diet and exercise, two areas the healthcare space really focuses on, that delta, the ostrich index, was really small. But the areas, the unmentionables that we mentioned before, caregiving stress, financial stress, those areas were off the chart. There was a big delta. People were saying this bothers them a lot, but they're not getting support. So that took us to 2011, where we came back to share the work we had done on the back of that, which was really to go see if the industry was interested, if our customers, if the big payers and PBMs and um, hospital systems out there would care about it. And 
to see if it actually did have an impact on people's health and productivity. So the first thing we did was incorporate, uh, ask Wendy formally, Wendy Lynch, who's known for being incredibly buttoned up from a data perspective. And what we realized is if what we're going to ask the healthcare space to do is really broaden its definition of what health is, and we're going to show data to that end, then we better be really buttoned up and super credible in terms of the approach that we've taken and the fact that our data is reliable. And that was the role that Wendy took. And then we went out to talk to people that we think are really smart in the healthcare space and to um, ask them, does this ring a bell for you? Does this make any sense to you? And these folks are not just thought leaders, but they are responsible themselves for the health and well-being of millions of lives. And so we thought that was important. And they overwhelmingly said, we think this is interesting. We'd love to hear more about it. So we did more research to look at, OK, well, can we get people to talk about the impact this has on their health? And what we found, and all of this, by the way, you can see I'm doing it very quickly, but you can watch it in detail from last year, or you can stop anyone from Eliza or anybody else who's seen it, and we can share the, the data in more detail. The unmentionables significantly and negatively impact health. They significantly and negatively impact productivity. We also saw the presence in the literature, and again in our own data, of these things you could call buffers and magnifiers, which really describe our natural coping abilities. And the idea is that when bad things happen to you, if you have a strong network that buffers specifically, positive coping factors are if you have a strong network of peers, if you have a strong sense of spirituality, and if you exercise a lot, that sort of picks you up and takes you away, so you end up um, dealing better with these things when they occur. But the opposite is also true, which is if you don't um, have the strong things, and in fact, instead, you have these negative magnifiers, we call them, which specifically were depression, trouble sleeping, and substance use. We very carefully say substance use and not abuse. This is not about someone who's a teetotaler. This is somebody who has three glasses of champagne instead of one. And I myself can attest to having had situations where something starts to make me crazy, trouble at work, and the next thing you know, I have three glasses of wine instead of one. I have trouble sleeping. Um, and then you start to feel blue, and this whole thing sort of erodes. The balance of that positive and negative coping mechanism actually was also very predictive of health and very predictive of productivity. And most importantly, when we went out and asked people, do you want help on these things from your doctor and your health plan and your employer, not only did the overwhelming majority, 80% for financial stress, 95% for caregiving, say, yes, we do, but there was no difference in their request for help across those three constituents which we sort of interpreted as being a sign that folks don't really care where they get the help. What they're really saying is, I'm dying, and you need, you need to help me with this. So the idea that life impacts health is not new. And in the last year, there have been some really cool studies that have come out. One of them is called the Heartbreak Study, which says that if a partner has a heart attack or is really having a hard time, the caregiver, in fact, is then at much greater risk of a heart attack. And I read people from time to time, and I was reading on the plane down here, and Rosie O'Donnell, in caring for her partner, just had a heart attack. And that's the kind of um, stuff that these studies are talking about. And as importantly, we're seeing evidence in the literature that when you look at the interest, where are people doing more and more studies, huge growth in the time period from 97 to 2012 in these, over to the right, less traditional factors. So diet and exercise and cholesterol, still growing, but growing at a slower level. And if you look at the unmentionables on the right, much faster. So Atul Gawande points out in one of his articles that the healthcare space does not do a very good job transitioning a finding like take a beta blocker after an MI to to practical use, to mainstream America use. In fact, the average time for a finding to get used or have um, be in the care of 50% of Americans is 15 years. And we thought, OK, so now we have all this incredible data that it looks like people are getting behind, that the unmentionables really matter, and we have to start taking this stuff seriously in our definition of health and how we support people. How do we make that happen in less than 15 years? So last year, we, we thought, well, let's get some big consumer brands to come up here and talk about it. So last year, we had Charlotte Ye, who is the chief medical officer of AARP Health Services, come and say, we believe that financial stress is a chronic condition. And then we had Marcus Osborne come and say, we believe that caregiving is a chronic condition. We also are asking you as a community, please give us tools that we can use for this population, specifically the 150 million uniques who come through their stores on a weekly basis. Um, Marcus also shared that caregivers over-index on intimacy products. Maybe it's a way to cope with stress. And if any of you don't know what intimacy products are, then you can talk to Matthew about that. Um, so that takes us to where we are today. And what I want to run you through for you guys really quickly, 
before we get to our panelists, is what we were able to sort of work on in the last year. As we took these findings out to friends and customers and just people in the industry, we would say, oh my gosh, do you think this stuff, what do you think? Isn't this amazing? We think this is so inspiring. People will say, it's really cool, so what are you going to do about it? And we say, we don't know. We'll get back to you. And we go back to Eliza and we think and we think. And the word that kept coming up for us to describe sort of the burden of these life factors and your coping or lack of coping kept coming down to be vulnerability. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could map a population, if we could really measure and quantify the impact of this vulnerability on a population and create an index? We weren't sure which of the unmentionables we could include in this index, and we wanted to be really sensitive to being careful as we launched it, and specifically holding anything that we stuck into this index up to these parameters. Was it actionable? Could the healthcare space do something about it? Is there predictive power in this variable? And then would it be acceptable? Would people actually accept talking about this? Would health plans, would employers, would they be okay talking about it? And would real people out in the wild be okay talking about it? And of the list of the unmentionables, the only two that didn't make the cut were job stress and sex, for obvious reasons. Now, we're not saying that those won't be included on the vul in vulnerability over time. We're just saying to be careful as we launch this so that we can actually get some traction going. And we're obviously going to be talking about one of those in a little bit. So the vulnerability index became this idea of putting together an algorithm that measures, first and foremost, the presence and impact of these life events, things like being a caregiver, having financial stress, having relationship stress, and then put that into um, association with your own personal, how well, how strong you are with your coping mechanisms that are positive and your coping neg neg mechanisms that are negative. And this would enable you to map out a population by vulnerability, which is a great way to think about allocating resources and to think about how you want to support somebody. If somebody's really highly, highly vulnerable, you know that not only are they more likely to be unhealthy, but they're less likely to have the capacity to focus on maybe some of the more traditional health factors like their diabetes. So if what we're all trying to do is impact outcomes, then one of the things that we want to figure out is what drives the variability of these outcomes. So we wanted to, to look at the, some of the factors that the healthcare space goes to quickly, for example, the presence of disease. So we looked at the, how powerful, is probably the best way to describe it, a composite of the 15, mo 15 most common conditions is when you're trying to explain the variance in self-reported health. And what we saw was the variance in self, 9% of that variance is explained by the presence of disease. Now, we also are big fans of all the data that's available now from some of these third-party databases and using things like demographics. And so we said, well, that's got data too. That's probably explaining some of the variance in self-reported health. Let's look at that and see how powerful that is. And we saw that that added 2%. Now, obviously, the reason that we were doing this is because we, our hunch was that the data that's resident in the measuring vulnerability would, in fact, be more predictive, be more powerful in explaining away why some people are healthy and why some people aren't. And in fact, it was. It was at 34%. So 34% of the variance in self-reported health is explained by these life factors and somebody's ability to cope positively and negatively. So basically, four times more predictive overall, which was stunning and exactly what we were hoping to see. We also wanted to check and make, see, make sure that we hadn't just stumbled upon a clever marker for BMI or for income. And anyone who's been part of the Great Recession knows nowadays that financial stress, for example, is not reserved for people who have lower incomes. In fact, this has become much more of an epidemic across the United States. And what we saw, in fact, was that there was no relationship and the information that was in the vulnerability index was true and new. And more importantly than when we took that concept and applied it specifically to something like adherence, which is a problem that we're all working on ferociously, the relationship held. So specifically, if you look at um, a population that's vulnerable and compare it to a population that's not vulnerable, and you ask the question, did you forget to take your medication, or slightly different, did you just not take it, which is usually more willful and for other reasons, you will see that basically double, a double the rate of, of non-adherence for the population that is vulnerable over the population that's not. So you can imagine the application of this when you're looking at a world of limited resources and you're trying to figure out how do we help with a population that's um, got issues with adherence. When you are trying to make the argument to an industry to say, 
we have to start re recognizing that health is life, and when life goes wrong, we go wrong, and this is something we need to take responsibility for. We uh, can't think of a better um, brand than Mayo and Lacey Hart of Mayo specifically to legitimize the fact that this stuff matters, that the unmentionables have a place in clinical workflow. And Lacey's going to come talk to you about the work that they are doing at the Beacon Project for Southeast Minnesota, which is specifically addressing this health is life factor. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I'm actually the program manager for the Southeast Minnesota Beacon community, one of the 17 Beacon communities across the country. When we had started exploring how to tackle the chronic condition of diabetes, one of the things we looked at was the burden of care. When you have diabetes or a chronic condition and you're managing that over time, you know, it, it gets kind of tedious measuring your hemoglobin A1C and your LDL and, and your blood pressure. And every visit you get prepared. In fact, our patients are so prepared they come in with their list and they, they describe that right away to the clinicians. Um, what they don't describe often in their eight minute visit is the fact that there's other factors influencing those measures. And so what we did is we tackled looking at the data gap or what was the missing information from our patients that we needed to address to properly care for their condition over time and reduce the burden of care. So you can see here we actually look at what is their biggest concern and this was developed by a cadre of researchers and a lot of them with our diabetic patient advocates. And so they really, we just go in and it's quite simple. Um, I'm showing you actually um, just the demonstration I'm going to show you live. And for those developers and vendors in the room, notice our Apache license, you can develop this too. So it's quite simple. Um, this can be delivered at um, the patient office. We also do it in patient homes with our public health nurses or it can be done on a patient portal before a patient even arrives. It can be delivered by a care manager. And it quite simply asks the patient when they come into a visit or at any point in time you'd like to measure, um, really what is their biggest concern? Well, you know, regardless of my financial status, maybe right now money is my biggest concern. Perhaps I'm having problems paying my bills. I'm not filling my prescription or I'm cutting my pills in half to avoid the medication burden. My overall quality of life, that's actually significant. So on a scale of zero to 10, anything less than five is clinically significant. And in fact, our studies have shown if you catch that within two months, you'll see an actual dip in their clinical measures for their diabetes care. We do the average um, questions of fatigue and pain, as well as asking some chronic condition specific questions, like is it hard to do the things um, that I have to do for my diabetes, am I feeling overwhelmed, or how much is my life um, affected by the time required. This generates a report that can be reviewed with the clinician, um, overall quality of life, um, and kind of where they scored in that range. And what the clinician gets to do with this, because um, you know clinicians, the first reaction when we launched this was, well, I don't know anything if they tell me they have money issues. Um, well, actually you do, because you notice that they were having problems paying their medical bills. Actually, internally, you generally have resources for that. Our system is designed to customize this by site, by community, so you can put in your internal resources um, there for your staff. In our particular community, this is actually managed by our community, so public health will respond to a lot of these questions. Now, what I can't show you because of PHI when I entered into the live system is the other report that happens is we can trend this over time. So when you're working with your patients, you can actually understand what are their biggest concerns over time, and you can connect that with their clinical measures to understand the impact. So I would encourage you, all of this is actually available, actually that's not the right website, if you go to www.semnbeacon.org, we have made all of this available, it's all open source. The entire toolkit is out there, so if you want to add this to your practice, whether it's paper-based, whether it's the open source tool, or if you want your vendors to develop it, all that information is out there. Thank you. How do we impact vulnerability? 
So we can be focused on decreasing magnifiers, we can be focused on increasing buffers, or in fact actually addressing these life factors directly. And a lot of you out in the audience have tools that are already specifically designed to do this stuff, right? It's just about fitting into a framework we think more aggressively with the payers and the big employers out there so that they, they do this more intentionally. So what we thought we would do is have Wendy, so Wendy who last year, and she obviously is a collaborator in the development of the unmentionables and the vulnerability index, much of this is her, her brainchild. We like to say she's over-educated and very published. And last year, you heard her describe the health effects of the work environment. And this year, she's going to come back and really talk about the power of social support as a buffer, the power of our friends to lift us up and help us when bad things are happening. So, Wendy Lynch. I'm always happy to be invited to uh, the ELISA party. It's a, a wonderful place to be invited as a resident nerd, and they accept me anyway. Um, Social support is not a unknown contributor to health. In fact, 35 years ago, just across the bay, there was a landmark study called the uh, Alameda 7. And what they determined was that social support had a dramatic impact regardless of your health status, your health risks, or your access to health services. And since then, what we've learned is that social support is one of the most fundamental factors in determining how long you'll survive. It determines what illnesses that you will get and how quickly you will recover from them. In fact, they've started to look at social support and actual bodily function at the enzyme level. And at that enzyme level, it affects cardiovascular disease, immunity, and hormonal responses. And when you don't have good social support, you actually get cranky. Can you check my calendar today and see if I'm scheduled to give a damn? Part of that is social support. Can you give it and do you get it? And part of it is the result of what's happened in our society. We do not have time. And in our 1,440 minutes every day, we spend a certain amount sleeping. With the rest of it, we spend most of it working. With the rest of it, we take care of our house and take care of our families. We spend a little bit of time trying to get a good meal. And with the remaining bits of time, it's leisure, which now is 90% television watching. So when we are spending all of that time watching our TV, we are not connecting with people. So what we need when we actually connect with people is we need a variety of different sources of support. We need the kind of support that is a mentor, the kind of support that provides us with information and tangible support, the kind of empathy we need and the sense of belonging. And what we've started to do is we've started to get that in different places. So a couple of examples. The patient websites now that we use in order to get information about procedures, in this case hip and knee replacement, you don't get categorized by how much you use the site. You also get categorized by the kinds of support that you give and you earn kinds of titles like Alpha and Don. And then you're not rated by how long you've been on the site or how many posts you've done, but how many thank yous you've received. And what happens because you have two knees or two hips is that you come back around and you give commentary and support when you come down to your next knee or your next hip. So what happens is, is that we start getting our support and advice and information. Then we start getting empathy and commiseration. Then we start actually connecting in a way that we allow somebody else to advise us. And we even see that they become friends. And folks are sharing recipes and telling jokes and sending pictures and asking about somebody's wife. So where we get our social support is changing. It's not just the group that's on the web and posting. Actually, of those 4,000 people posting, millions of people are reading those posts and getting support. And the last example is that now we see that homeless 
are spending the few dollars that they have connecting actually through Facebook and Twitter with their families and getting not only tangible support but also the belonging and the sense of connection that they need. So this is why we believe that social support ended up being a strong buffer in the unmentionables. And so I appreciate the chance to address you today. Thank you. Many of you in the audience are probably caregivers. There are 60 million now in the United States. One in eight of us are actually in the sandwich generation where we're caring for aging parents and also caring for kids. 22 hours a week, twice the rate of depression. Um, being a caregiver is absolutely an isolating and extremely exhausting task. So the good news, I think, is that the healthcare space is really evolving to begin to address this. And what you're looking at is a couple of the websites from Aetna, KP, Humana, AARP, and the logos of a couple of associations that are getting more and more active around how do we support caregivers? How do we make sure these folks have what they need in the time of need? And what's really exciting is when you have someone like United that cares for one out of every five Medica Medicare Advantage members putting the kind of time and attention into, into caregiving that you are, I think it's a sign that the industry is starting to move. So we're going to hear from Terry Clark, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of United Healthcare Medicare and Retirement. He's also responsible for the marketing, innovation, and business development that's focused on the entire 50-plus population, and he's developing initiatives to engage with the 9 million um, Medicare ben beneficiaries who are currently enrolled in their plan. So Terry, thinking about this stuff is, is a good thing. Terry. Yay. Thanks. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, I'm gonna, I want to talk a little bit about caregiving. We had, uh, it's, it's my time of year when I do two stump speeches. It's either about caregiving and the missed opportunity in healthcare, or it's about boomers and how every marketer in the world is missing that opportunity. So we'll go to caregiving today, but if anyone wants to stick around later, I'll give the boomer speech. Um, let, me, let me talk to you a little bit about caregiving and one, why we're so uh, focused on it, United, and then uh, a little of, uh, of how I think the industry could and, and should be thinking about it. Um, a couple of stats just to get us started. Uh, we, we talked about 65 million is the estimated number of caregivers. It's, it's amazing. If I pulled this room, I can tell you, because I do a lot of times, that almost, or caregiving touches almost every person. And almost every person in here, either you're a caregiver now or you expect to be a caregiver at some uh, period in the, in the future. And uh, several years ago, we were talking about this sandwich generation as boomers really aged in and they were taking care of their parents and they were taking care of their kids. We really think there's, there's kind of a club sandwich generation now. And that is the, it's, it's caring for multiple generations. You're caring for uh, your parents and potentially parents beyond that. And you're caring for your kids. And it means uh, a lot of stress and burden on, on this industry. Right now, it's predominantly female. That's the caregiver out there. 66% of it is female. And it's, uh, it's, it's a huge burden based on the age. So it's a 48-year-old woman is the, is the primary caregiver right now, uh, and, and uh, a large percentage of those care for relatives. Um, a few things is we did, uh, we did a study a few years back on, on the decline of, of health and caregivers. So while caregiving is such a big initiative, and think about 77 million baby boomers that are aging right now, and the burden and, and opportunity that creates in the caregiving space for the future, well, right now it has such a huge impact on those people giving care. So uh, a huge percentage have seen a, a decline in their own health. So 87% see uh, uh, energy loss and depression, um, their own health declining at that point, and really are, are, are looking for ways to, to take the burden off of that. So the key things that when we, when we looked and researched these were people were looking for opportunities to save their own time. Uh, a great percentage of these were working 40 hours a week just on caregiving, trying to balance jobs in the same time. So to do that, can you, can you relieve some of the stress? Can you coordinate the communication? I know I was a caregiver for a period of time. I was trying to do it with a brother that was in Boston, a sister that was in New York, and we were trying to care for our dad that was in Chicago, next to impossible. So that care and coordination is so important. When we looked at it, we put together uh, the five health stages. We've done a lot of research into health stages. There's a lot of different ways that we segment uh, uh, membership, segment the individual, but really everything boils down to five uh, life stages. There's normal state, steady state in there. A steady state is someone that's actually developed some chronic condition or some condition they're dealing with, uh, but they've learned how to manage it. And it's, you know, then it's managing health conditions and, and the events that go with that. There's an eventual decline as people age or have an issue, and then there's caretaking overall that happens across the board with all of these. And as we look at those, I go back, uh, we really look at it as 
how much engagement happens in there from low to high. And you're living life and you've got not a lot of health events, you've got low. And we have a lot of that that's the young and invincible. But as you age or as there becomes some uh, relevant thing that happens, diagnosed with something, chronic condition, uh, something more serious, it goes into a transition. And each one of those transitions falls into caregiving. So there's some caregiving component that, that works with that. And in an absence of time, I'm going to give you the example of what's going on with that. So a, a lot of those people, as we tried to segment them and try to get really relevant uh, tools that go with it, uh, we, we look at the attributes that are on there. And the attributes of caregivers really scream that there is a need, a need for new tools and resources that can meet those unidentified needs with unidentified people, because most caregivers are not self-identifying themselves, so hard to find them and how to go. And lastly, I'll just take you through uh, what where our plan is. Our plan is really to look for tools to simplify, personalize, and care. And in each one of those, we help our caregivers, giving them the tools that they need for the future, so that's the information they need, an advocate inside our organization that can help them work through the needs that they, they have, tools both online and, and, and with their provider, personalized tools that will make it more relevant to them and the person they're caring for, and then ways to actually care. We put a few of them in there, but it's really looking for the tools and resources out there that will make a difference in caregivers' lives. And as I said, 77 million baby boomers aging, 28% of people are caregivers right now that they need to take advantage, and overall, a, 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 a massive tsunami of an opportunity for America as a whole. Next up is SAP. SAP is one of the largest software companies in the world. They think the idea of the dimensional is important. As they were thinking about how to come into the consumer space, one of the first areas they picked was caregiving. Um, they're really sort of putting together a base camp on which they will build a share of plans across the family. And we're going to hear from Fahim, who's going to share a specific example, and then talk a little bit about their plans over time. So please welcome Fahim. There. Hello. Thanks, Alex. Thank you again. Good afternoon. I want to talk about the accidental caregiver. This is not a healthcare professional. This is someone just like you and me, somebody who didn't ever think they were going to be a caregiver, but then something happened. Their spouse or their sister got cancer, or one of the parents was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, or their own child was diagnosed with autism. If that happened to you, what would you do? Where would you go? You can try Google, but 1.2 million hits doesn't really help. You want very little information, but you want it to be the right information. So we created Care Circles. Can you guys see my screen? OK. So we created Care Circles. Care Circles is here to help you coordinate care with your team. It helps you deliver the best care and gives you peace of mind by knowing that you're on top of things. It starts with a circle. I've created a circle for Alex. Alex is a charming little boy with Asperger's. Um, we have a journal for him, so we can share with the whole team what's going on in his life, and you can see what's going on over here. Adding a journal entry is as simple as this. You can add photos, videos, whatever you want, so you can share with your team what's going on. And it's private. It's only shared with the people you've invited. So it's like having your very own Facebook. Nobody else can ever come in. There's no intrusive ads over here. Um, the team gets to know who each other is. They can see profiles. They can choose how much they want to share with each other. It's all delightfully easy and simple to use. But for me, having a journal and a team is only the starting point. What are you going to do? What's the plan? And this is where we get stumped. So we wanted to make it really easy for you to create a plan and give you the building blocks, almost like Lego. So here you can see Alex's plan has two things. There's a behavior modification plan. And there's a plan for implementing inclusion in the classroom. Now I want another plan. I'm about to start a medication for anxiety. So I could start writing it up myself, but wouldn't it be great if I could just pick something that somebody else has already written? Surely somebody else has done this before? That's what we thought. So we created a marketplace of strategies that you can adopt. And you can create your own. And there's a crowdsource marketplace called Caregivers Like Me, where you can see what other people have written. Um, and you can see some really good stuff over here. But we are also working with lots of partners to bring the right strategies to you, curated strategies that are reliable, that are branded. So here, the National Fragile X Foundation, our first partner, has given a few strategies for dealing with ADHD, for helping adults with uh, transitioning to work, for implementing inclusion, for reducing aggression, for talking on a phone, 
uh, for treating anxiety. Hey, that sounds about right. Let's adopt this one. So it's as simple as that. You can compose your care plan on the fly. Um, now, what do you do with a care plan? Let me log out and let me show you how one of the therapists might actually use this. Um, so when you log in as a therapist, you see your care circles. Now you notice that she sees different circles than I did, because these are her circles. And she's caring for Alex, but she's also caring for Delarai and Gina. So if she goes into Alex's plan, she will instantly see the changes that we've just added over here. And she can read about anxiety. She can read about the SSRIs that we're thinking of trying. She can also see the behavior modification plan over here. And there's lots of educational materials here about you know, how children with autism deal with tantrums and why they have them. And there's even a tantrum tracker. Imagine that. So you can see that, well, intensity is going down, duration is also going down, so we're on the right track. And if she wants to add a new data point, it's as simple as saying, well, today, tantrum was on a scale of 1 to 10. It was a 3, and it only lasted 15 minutes. And you can customize these to track anything you want. So it's really, really simple. Um, and the changes are instantly reflected in the journal. So I've got the Stop Now sign. I'll stop here. But that's Care Circles. It's coming soon to a family near you. We're starting with special education and kids with special needs, but we're going to cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, everything. So come to us if you have content. Thank you. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the concept of the sushi difficulty scale. And it is the idea that uh, cucumber maki um, is somewhat easier to swallow than, let's say, uni which my friend Sarah described as a loogie the other day. <laughs> I'm just going to out her on that. So one of the things that we're really fascinated with is how do things become acceptable and how do concepts and topics move through healthcare so that we can adopt them as our own. And an area that probably 50 years ago we would never have felt comfortable talking about was depression. In fact, we didn't even think it was a disease. We thought it was something you should just pull up your socks. Fast forward 50 years, not only now do we know that there is a disease, that there's lots we can do caused by a chemical imbalance, but it really has become okay to actually talk about it. We think it is not that much harder to swallow to think that very soon, think about what SAP just said, what Terry just said, I know there's a bunch of companies in the audience today who are working on caregiving, um, that the act of being a caregiver is like having a disease, and we're going to see more and more activity around this space. Now, the idea, perhaps, that we as an industry would believe that having a bad sex life or a lack of intimacy impacted your health, maybe that's going to be a little bit harder for us to swallow. Maybe that's more octopus on the, on the sushi difficulty scale. But we believe, for a couple of reasons, that this is actually going to get sped up and that in a few years we probably will be in a situation where we felt comfortable talking about this stuff. Um, reason number one is in... Exchanges, no matter what, are consumer-driven. And in a consumer-driven market, sex is mainstream, right? This is like no-brainer, ground zero, of course you talk about it. In addition, and I'm sort of shocked actually because I spoke with some of my friends earlier today who have not read this book, and they said, well, I never read books. And I said, I don't ever read books, but I found the time to read these books. I will tell you that. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know what this is, this has been classified by the media as mummy porn. And that really is. And the fact that it was one, two, and three on the bestseller list, I think begins to sort of loosen up the country a little bit, and hopefully by extension, the healthcare space in our ability to talk about sex, which is what we're going to do right now. Deb Levine, many of you might know her as Go Ask Alice, where it's basically a Q&A. Um, about 80% of the questions that they get, it's open to everything, anything related to your health. 80% come down to sex, sexuality, and relationships. But what Deb figured out is that if she wanted to address sex in a government-sanctioned, healthcare-centric way, she had to get much more specific. And actually, the approach that she took is maybe one that we can all learn from, which is to say, instead of going out there and advocating, let's all get more action and better action, Deb said, why don't we start by saying, first, do no harm. And first, do no harm with one of our most vulnerable populations, college-age kids, who are just starting off on this aspect of their life. And so she created an application called um, Circle of Six that she is going to talk about. Deb? Um, 
Hi. So when I worked at Columbia University on Go Ask Alice, I also had another job. And my job was to go out and talk to college students, uh, the first-year students, uh, the sororities, the fraternities, the people in the residence halls about acquaintance rape, sexual assault, and sexual violence. Um, I did a lot of small presentations, large presentations, first-year orientation, and I heard a lot of horrific stories. And I firmly believe that the Circle of Six mobile app that I'm about to show you could have prevented many of these safety disasters. Um, the Circle of Six this year won the uh, HHS and White House Challenge, um, Apps Against Abuse. It's very, very simple. Um, you take six people in, from uh, your contact list, and you really pick six people who you trust that are actually going to help you out in a difficult situation. And you add the six people, and then you can ask them to help you out in various situations. So I'm going to give you the situations. One of them um, is really just uh, young women, if they're in a relationship that doesn't quite feel right, um, they, they don't know where to go and they don't know where to turn. And they can't really talk to their boyfriend about it because their boyfriend right now is isolating them from their, situ from their friends and family. So what they can do, literally, is just, uh, what they end up doing is looking at relationship quizzes. So Cosmo, they look at the magazines, they go online. And what they can do here is actually tell their friends just by tapping on the chat icon that they're looking up information about healthy relationships. And that way, when their friend comes to see them, the next time they have a way to open that conversation. And that's a simple SMS message. So here's another situation, um, blind date. Woman goes out on a blind date. She follows all the rules. She meets people in a public. She meets the guy in a public place. Um, she keeps it short. Uh, she tells a friend where she's going, and she goes out to the date. And she realizes pretty quickly this is not the right person. About 20 minutes in, she says, "You know, I, I have something else I have to do." And um, this guy gets really upset and actually makes a scene. What she's supposed to do at that point, what she can do is just tap the fo phone icon, and an SMS message goes to six friends that says, call me and pretend you need me. I need an interruption. Um, and the, the next one is actually the, uh, based on the buddy system. You know, we're all told to go to parties uh, with a buddy, but what happens if your buddy gets drunk, your buddy hooks up with somebody else um, early on in the evening, and you have no way to get home? All you have to do is tap the car icon, come and get me, I need help getting home safely, and call when you're close. Circle of Six also has emergencies. There's two hotlines and a custom hotline that you can use. And you can also tell your friends um, when you've already gotten help. Um, we've had 30, 32,000 downloads in the first six months, but there are 10.5 million female college students in the US today. If you'd like to help get this free app into more women's hands and learn more about ISIS projects, you can email me at deb at isis-inc.org or my Twitter handle is at Deb Isis. Thank you. In 2010, some of you remember on that fateful panel, Cupid Me was a part of that panel. And it was a way to show to a potential sex partner that you did not, in fact, have an STD. Now there is an app that lets you check on others with a goal, really, of stopping the spread in a community. This is particularly important in inner city populations with um, STDs like chlamydia. Um, Jessica Ladd of So They Can Know. So let's say that I get diagnosed with chlamydia, which currently infects 12% of young adult African Americans and can cause serious reproductive health complications. My doctor gives me one pill which cures me of my disease and lets me know that I need to notify all of my at-risk sex partners. Chances are, if that's all my doctor does, I won't notify 77% of my at-risk sex partners. Luckily, I have a really awesome doctor, and my doctor gives me this card, which tells me about a website called So They Can Know. I go online and visit the inform page. And here I can look up lots of options about how to break this kind of awkward news to my partner. I can look up tips about how to tell my partner myself, scripts about how to have that conversation, or watch videos modeling effective STD partner communication, 
Or if that just seems too awkward, or I'm afraid of my partner's reaction, I can send my partner an anonymous email. So in this case, I have chlamydia. I'll select it here. I preview the message. I certify that I'm using the website legitimately. And I put in my partner's email address. And I can add up to 10 partners if I've had a lot of fun. In this case, I have only had one who is my sex partner one. Oh, yep. At gmail. And I go down and I enter a CAPTCHA value to prove that I am not a robot. It would be terrifying to him. And I send the message. Now, after the, I send this message, I'm asked why I just sent that email, because we do not want to count every single email generated from the site as a success, and we care a lot about rigorously evaluating this. So in this case, I sent it to myself for another reason, and I submit that. Now, I'm my sex partner. And I go, I check into uh, my Gmail account, and I have this email from So They Can Know. I open it up, and it lets me know that somebody who has been diagnosed with chlamydia would like to anonymously inform me that I might also have chlamydia. And it lets me know how I can get the disease, that I probably won't show symptoms, and that my partner probably didn't either, that I can get cured if I go see my doctor, and what might happen if I don't get cured. I'm then referred back to the test page of So They Can Know, where I can look up clinics near me, in a website uh, that is maintained by the CDC, and it'll show me clinics in my nearby area. I can also search for clinics through ZocDoc for providers that take my insurance who provide STD testing or order a self-collection kit online. I go in, I get tested, I get cured, and I notify my partners. And that's where it gets really interesting. If I notify all my partners, and they notify all theirs, and they notify all theirs, you end up tracing back along the lines of disease transmission with communication and cure. And you have the potential to actually eradicate disease from entire communities. And that's what I really care about. So they can know as a nonprofit, we build this entirely with volunteers and launched at a cost of less than $5,000. And if you're interested in help creating an STD-free generation, find me later today or tomorrow. Thank you. The idea really was that if we're trying to address this massive space, maybe we should get very specific, and certainly um, there are a lot of tools available today to let us get more specific with specific populations. Um, and the idea of maybe first, do no harm, make sure that everybody is safe and protected. Um, when you do that well, maybe then you earn the right to expand a little bit into having a little bit of this fun that the person with 10 partners was clearly having. Um, so what we're going to hear from next is Anna Girmati. She has an app which is really the Go Ask Alice of Hungary, staying with the younger population still. It's a general health site for teens, but you can imagine what questions the teens are asking. Anna. Hello. So I would like to show you Kamaspanas. Um, there are so many uncomfortable and unmentionable things in a teen's life because most of the time they are just too afraid or too shy to ask about these things or talk about these things. And Kamaspanas would like to solve this problem and I want to show you through an example that how it actually works. Um, the presentation is going to be a bit funny but not because of me, because of the translation, because our site runs in Hungarian but I've translated it with Google Translate to you, so sorry about this strange English. Um, so what can a teen do here? Let's take this example. Let's say that we have a um, 16-year-old girl who had unprotected um, sex with her boyfriend yesterday, and now she's scared because she might be pregnant. Um, what she first can do is to log in and then go to the escort doctor application um, where she can just type in her question and send it to one of our physicians who answered for every kind of health or mental health related questions in only two days. Um, now she sent her question. 
Uh, what else can she do? She can use a um, keyword to search for a special topic, or she can just simply go to our sex section, where she can read articles about um, contraception, general information, problems, or pregnancy. So let's say that she goes to contraception and browses between the articles. Most of our articles are translated or written by us, teen editors, um, but all of them are overseen by our physicians to be sure that we are providing clear and reliable medical information. Um, if she goes to an article, um, she can just uh, read it, and uh, she's also able to see the similar related articles and the recent articles of the section. If she couldn't understand the word, she can look it up in our sex dictionary, which probably covers all of the terms and expressions uh, in connection with sex and tries to explain it in a more casual, more teenage language. What else can she do? Um, she can go to the interactive section and she can share her story in the Your Story section where all of our users can share their own stories and experiences or special thoughts. She is also able to write um, a post about the case in her personal blog, or it's even possible that she has a sex-related blog because we have kind of a lot of blogs in the sex topic. She's also able to go to the forums and discuss it with um, the other teens uh, in one of the sex-related topics or she's also able to just uh, make a new topic in connection with, um, with her case. But uh, one of our most popular forums are just in connection with taboos or, uh, that's my favorite, have sex wisely. <laughs> um, yes, our team just got her answer. It looks like that. Um, and she takes the advice that she gets from the physician or from the other teens. It's sure that she will have a more safe and more happy sexual life. Thank you. This is going to be a tough transition, but I'm going to manage it. Um, well, first, I have to uh, just say quickly that our thought was when we began the discussion um, about the sushi difficulty scale, we were laughing, the folks who were putting this together and saying, well, if this was successful and if the introduction of the exchanges really does make these conversations in a respectful and, honor respectful and honorable way more mainstream, what kind of apps, after we've first done no harm, would we want? And someone had the idea that we could do a developer challenge next year of bringing Fifty Shades of Grey to life. And you will notice this caveat that I do in honor of my mother um, in a non-sexist, non-paternalistic, totally female-empowered way. So this would be the, the charge that we, put out, we would put out there in the developer challenge. So the idea of the Inventionables overall is to make it possible, bring up topics that we believe influence health but that we're not talking about. And while advanced care and end of life is not specifically an, un an unmentionable that we've talked about historically, there is perhaps no more unmentionable topic than that one. And if you want to look at statistics for an area where we're doing very poorly, this is everywhere, right? 70% of people want to die at home, only 30% do. And the good news is up until a couple of years ago, we were making enormous progress in this area. And there are whole parts of the healthcare space that have always done this well and have always understood the importance of doing this well, areas like hospice, but that really hadn't gotten to the mainstream. And we began to see evidence when folks like the IOM, this was being written into the Affordable Care Act, great progress around doing end-of-life and advanced care differently. And then the death panel fiasco happened, and we saw really a pulling back and people being afraid to be associated in any way, shape, or form with this topic because it was considered so toxic. And I think over the last couple of months, we're actually seeing that curtain lifting a little bit. I don't know how many of you caught Paul Ryan really distancing himself from the topic of a death panel. Bill Frist wrote a piece that's gotten lots of attention. And on major uh, magazine covers like Time, there was an article today in the New York Times, I don't know how many of you guys saw it, about how to do this better, that as a country overall, we have to do this better. So there's a group that I think is also a wonderful indication of the progress being made, which is called the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care. And its mission is to make sure that each and every American has their end of life, their advanced care wishes honored and respected. 
And what they're really creating in some ways is a safe harbor. They're convening together all the folks who have individually worked so hard to do this better and giving them a place to come together and actually make a difference. So you've got all the big associations, big employers like Goodyear, um, national um, faith-based and community groups that you can see right there, um, big integrated delivery systems and hospital groups. And then, by extension, more and more, we're actually now seeing big health plans who are coming in and saying, we agree and we want to be part of this. And this umbrella that CTAC gives lets us actually address this in a way that we might not have been able to earlier. So what that ends up creating for all of us as a community is sort of a fertile ground. And one of the things that CTAC is building is a portal that you'd be able to go to and depending on the help that you needed, be able to access all the resources that are available today to do end of life better. Resources like what we're going to hear about right now from Jeff Zucker, who's the CEO of My Directives. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. It's an honor to be on the stage with you and all the good work that you've brought to this topic and nice to be here with everyone today. I have followed some topics in my career, but this is different. So your transition was great, and we're gonna go from the sex talk to uh, a different topic, and that is uh, what we do at MyDirectives.com. Again, I'm Jeff Zucker, I'm the CEO of AD Vault. We're based in Dallas, Texas, and we're proud to be the creators of MyDirectives.com, the world's first all digital emergency or advanced care planning platform. We allow consumers people, actually all of you, to go online and create an average of about six, six and a half minutes, according to our statistics, create a digital advanced care plan. It's available to you 24-7 anywhere in the world. And uh, you don't really have to answer the questions at the time of a crisis if you do it in advance. And that's the big paradigm shift we're trying to get people to make. We don't ask people to talk about organ donation or buy life insurance on their deathbed. Why should we be asking people to make these questions, answer these questions when they can do it in advance? And if you do, we have a paradigm shift in the whole healthcare continuum about the way you feel as a patient, your caregivers feel, and the way they can take care of you. Nurses and doctors who otherwise see you as a stranger on a gurney all of a sudden can know something about you and deliver better care for you. In the very short period of time we have here today, I'll show you a quick glimpse of someone's directive. We have a person who would have uh, already logged in and created their directive. They get to go back for free anytime they want and update and change their wishes. This person would be answering a very simple question, what's important to you? They can click and add something. They can take something off. If they have an issue that's not there, they can open an open-ended text box. We try to get away from the legal yes and no and get into the gray, the maybe. These issues are ranked on the side and you can just drag and drop and decide what's important to you. And you can imagine with millions and millions of records in the database for medical informatics, when we talk about big data, we can drill down into a zip code, into a gender, into an age group, and find out where society is having a confusion, a disconnect between palliative care and hospice care, two different terms that society often confuses. This data is incredibly valuable on the back end, but for the user, for the caregiver, for the patient, all of a sudden, you are freed up from the guilt, the burden, and the uh, fear that someone's going to make decisions about you and for you when you can't speak for yourself. As you roll through the site, we ask you some basic legal questions that we have to ask. Uh, we ask you some optional questions. These are research is showing us are actually more valuable to the consumer than the legal questions. These are the questions about what are my hopes and my fears? This person's actually, I believe, telling us he wants ESPN Sports Center on in his hospital room. That's gonna make him feel better, and if he can't communicate, that's gonna make a difference for him. He actually tells us what foods he likes and doesn't like. He, this person has actually posted a playlist of music he'd like to hear, and he has a very personal note to his parents that he's listed. We use audio, video, text, the yes or no questions, and we get a very good quality plan. When you're done with your plan, you get to review it. Very simply, you get to see the legal document. The stuff in blue is the stuff that you've answered. If you don't like it, you can click and edit it in real time. Doctors told us, though, and we were in research for six years before we went live earlier this year, doctors told us they wanted something actionable. So here's a summary for physicians that gives them real-time access to the key things they need to know to make decisions about someone who would otherwise be a stranger in front of them. This information, some of it highlighted in red because doctors told us that, is available through APIs to electronic medical records platforms. 
Uh, so for 24-7, 20, seven, seven days a week anywhere in the world, you don't have to worry about having the information on you. The doctors can get it. We have a secure mobile app for 911 first responders. So after that car accident, uh, the patient is on the side of the road, and the paramedic can get some real-time information about who this person is and deliver great quality care. All the information doves back into a personal dashboard that gives you the ability to communicate, talk to your friends and family, make sure they know what's going on, and we can track all that for you. Again, the site has been live for about six months with no marketing whatsoever. We already have users in over 35 states, 14 countries. We're HIPAA compliant. We comply with the European Convention. We are blue button compatible, and that's a, that's a feature that's been live on our site now for three weeks. We're very proud of that. We're the only advanced care plan to be meaningful use certified, and we're thrilled to be here today to show you not only a glimpse of the future, but something you can do today to change health care for yourself, for your family, and for society as a whole. Thanks very much. Next up is Alan Pitt, and he's going to talk to us about his company, Emerge MD, uh, which has started for a very personal reason, which I think Alan will share with us. So um, I think Matthew kind of asked me to talk because I couldn't believe I had somebody had a story that fit everything together. So he asked me to tell you a little bit about me and my family first. So I'm just going to go through that, and then we'll talk about the application. So. Um, the first picture there you see on the upper left is my father in 1965, and he carried the usual black bag, and uh, he would make house calls. And in that black bag was pretty much all you needed in 1965. Well, that black bag has gotten heavier and heavier with options. And now there's probably not a physician on this planet that could carry that black bag. There's too many things that we can do for each other that any one physician can uh, provide that care. Well, I, I followed my, my father's footsteps, and I'm a physician now. I, I'm a, a fairly senior physician at a big neuro institute in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, uh, life plays cruel tricks on you. So uh, several years ago, <coughs> my mother uh, fell off a horse and became a quadriplegic. So you can see her down in the lower corner. Her name is Sheila Pitt. You can look up her website. And she was an art professor. She's gone back to, to teaching art, but from her wheelchair and um, what I noticed was uh, I had her aerovac out, and I took care of her in the hospital. I could control that, but uh, each step along the way from acute to subacute to chronic, I lost control, and today I'm just as disconnected as any of you from your loved one in terms of her care. She's 100 miles away in Tucson, and her care sounds more like a book on physiology with care providers. There's somebody for lungs, and there's somebody for kidney, and there's somebody for neuro. And her care is completely fragmented. So um, it's hard to complain, though, when you're middle-aged, when your mother's a quadriplegic, I'll tell you. So um, my sister, who's the other person there, she's a social worker. And um, she's also trained in therapy. And years ago, she used to work for Hospice the Valley. And I, I want to be clear, uh, the word hospice uh, connotates something where you go and you die a few days later. So hospice is not somewhere you go and die, at least particularly for Hospice of the Valley. Hospice is, is somewhere you go to live, but with an acknowledgement that you're mortal. So people in hospice now uh, may live in hospice two days, two weeks, two months, two years. And hospice of the Valley in particular, and most hospices, are looking for ways to care for people. And it's absolutely critical that they provide a patient ecosystem my sister found that um, she was trying to run care provider, uh, caregiver seminar support groups, and they would show up once and only once, and the reason for that was they didn't have time to come back because they had so much time they had to put in taking care of their loved ones. And so there, there was this further fragmentation of the ecosystem based on those demands. So EmergeMD is a company that uh, I feel passionate about. I like helping them. Uh, they are a telemedicine company, uh, but they're actually kind of more than that. They're trying to manage the continuum and to provide an aggregate so you can see outcomes. So most telemedicine is transactional. They're, they're looking to do something more. I almost call it an ACO accelerator for those of you in, in healthcare from the C level. So if we look at um, the application here, this is basically a social network, like probably many other applications you've seen. The provider has put in their name, their role, their cell, their page, or their email. But the different thing here is that we've actually emulated workflow. So this very much looks like a care cycle, if you will. So you could reach out to somebody by name or by role, and they basically built in call calendaring. So I may not know who you are, 
uh, and I simply click on your name or your role and you get a message from me and you can be brought in to an application. And um, you can see here that um, you get a clinical capsule. So imagine, if you will, you're a social worker in the home and you want to reach out to somebody. So you basically can send this clinical capsule off to somebody, give them a little information. It bounces back into the same cues that you've seen here. The provider knows that there's someone in need, a social worker, and they're able to come into consultation and answer the question. So we can bring up all sorts of things, all sorts of documents to add to the care cycle and it makes it very easy to provide the care. So this is really uh, kind of a big deal that we're able to do this. Um, we can bring that doctor right to the bedside. So I brought in a friend, and this, this, this iPad becomes your, well look at that, I brought myself up instead of my friend. And so this iPad becomes your, your little black bag where you're able to have a distensible community around that patient you're able to bring together that entire network of people in a way that makes sense. So if we go back to where we were, the goal here really is that we want to bring everything together around that patient to stand those folks up. We want to manage that continuum. We want to look at outcomes. We want to be able to support that patient, not just with a single, a single provider, but that entire ecosystem. And we want to be able to provide reassurance at the bedside because ultimately that's what telehealth is about. It's about reassurance. It's about making sure that everybody's okay. If we can do that, we've really accomplished something important. Thank you for your time. So I think it's interesting how many of us get involved in what we do because of personal stories. Both of the companies that a lot of the companies in this space were founded based on personal experience and engaged with Grace was founded for that very same reason. Um, my personal story was about my sister-in-law, who was a gorgeous, joy-filled, 32-year-old mother of a two-year-old. When she was diagnosed with glioblastoma stage four, which is one of the most terrible cancers that there is. And over the seven months between her diagnosis and when we lost her, no matter how much we loved her, I don't think we did the very best job caring for her. She spent most of those seven months in a hospital at the mercy of a system that has a really hard time letting go of a young and vibrant woman. And she endured every test and every treatment at the expense of her ability to be with her husband, to be with her daughter, to be in her home. And really at the, at the expense of those three words, quality of life, and when you don't have a lot of life left to live, those three words matter an awful lot. So how did that happen? Because we didn't have the words or the contest to ask her if that's what she wanted, and no moment ever seemed right to bring it up. In the end, the only reason we got her home was because one of us, not me, stood up and said, enough, we're leaving the hospital. And we did, against the advice of her incredibly qualified care team. And we got her home on the night before she died, one night for her to bond with her two-year-old daughter, Alessia, one night that gave Alessia the chance to really crawl up into bed next to her mom, to tuck her head into the crook of her mommy's neck. And one very special night for Za to wake up for the first time in a week and really sort of infuse her daughter with all the love of a lifetime. And the next night, she died. And we almost missed that one night. One night that really could have or should have been 30 nights, 60 nights. Now, why did we do so poorly with Zaz's care? First of all, because we never, ever talked about it. This is something that we as a community have to change. We have to start talking about this stuff, knowing our preferences, sharing them with our loved ones, committing to advocating for each other. And the wrong time to have that conversation is at the bedside. We need to be having these conversations now, all of us, and be having them over time as our preferences change. So if nothing else, after all you've seen here today, I hope that you will go to engagewithgrace.org, download this one slide, share it with your family, make sure you can answer these questions for yourself and for your loved ones, and then commit to passing it along and commit to advocating for each other. But I think the other reason why we didn't do a great job caring for Za was because we were caregivers. And we were caregivers for someone for whom we cared so intensely, but we didn't really know what it was that she wanted. And being a caregiver when times are tough is ground zero. 
And for some of us, I think it makes us sort of suck at everything that we do. Now, as an industry, we are trying to figure out how to be consumer centric. And I would argue that if I am a caregiver, just making my benefit details available to me online or making it possible for me to check into my appointment through a mobile application is definitely cool, but I don't think it goes far enough. It might be that in order for us to really transition from these headlines, which we showed in the beginning, that have really not changed at all in 20 years except for getting worse, to these headlines, which would show that we were finally actually making progress, we have to think about walking a mile in the shoes of the people that we are all, are all caring so much about serving. And specifically, if I'm a caregiver, know that helping me find resources to relieve that burden might be the very best thing that you could do for my high blood pressure. Or if I'm going through a divorce, help me with the sleep I'm losing before you're sending me things to help me do a better job managing my diabetes. And yes, we should then also go ahead and make things, these, these things mobile and make them online. So earlier, you remember that one of the buffers is spirituality. And whether you believe in God or nature or whatever it is for you, the idea of spirituality is not religion-based. It's this idea that you, ha you have a sense that there's something greater than all of us. So I carry this card around with me in my wallet that I got at a Hallmark, um, which is called Footprints in the Sand. And I pull it out and I read it whenever I'm having a really horrific day. And I don't know if any of you guys know it. It's basically the story of this guy who goes to heaven and when he gets to heaven, he's talking to God, and he looks back over his life, and he sees these two sets of footprints in the sand. And he says to God, I'm looking back, and I'm noticing that you were always there with me, that you were walking next to me, except in my worst times, my times of trial and suffering, then there's only one set of footprints, and I really don't understand. Why did you leave me then? And so God looks at him and says, oh, my son, um, in, your times in, trial of suffering, in your times of trial and suffering, I would never leave you. It was then that I carried you. I think as an industry, we have a choice. We're not God, obviously, and we don't have to pretend that we are, but we are keepers of the health and well-being of real people. And I think we have to ask ourselves, are we carrying people at the right time? It might be, in fact, that to figure out how to go forward, we have to go back and one of my favorite quotes in the whole world from the 1500s, Amboise Pere, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of this guy, cure sometimes, relieve often, comfort always. Let's commit to being consumer-centric in a way that revolves around real people with real lives that can sometimes be a mess. And I, for one, would be really happy to drink to that. And I hope all of you will join me in the cocktail hour, which is beginning right now downstairs. And thank you. Thank you.